However, their coexistence on the same island did not prove to be as intimate as Lear would have wished. Frank threw himself into his new job with enthusiastic dedication, working long hours nearly every day. The Corfits were as incorrigibly litigious then as they are now. And uh, they uh, mostly over border disputes with their neighbors. And he had to deal with over a thousand cases a year. But one gets the impression from Lear's diaries and letters that Frank used his work as an excuse to withdraw from the intensity of Lear's devotion. Though evidently fond of him, valuing his friendship for his wit and charm and sensibility, Frank was unable to respond with the same unconditional and love and attention that Lear both gave and craved for. Another lifelong friend and correspondent was Chichester Fortescue, a good-looking, intellectually bright aristocrat, 11 years younger than Lear, whom he met in Rome in 1845. A strong mutual attachment rapidly formed between them. And from Fortescue's diaries, one gets a very vivid sense of what a delightful companion Lear could be. Soon after they met, he wrote, he is full of nonsense, puns, riddles, everything in the shape of fun, and brimming with intense appreciation of nature as well as history. I don't know when I have met anyone to whom I took so great a liking. For his part, Lear was powerfully smitten. They traveled about the Roman Campania together and Lear taught him to sketch. In comparison with Lushington, Fortescue seems to have been better able to manage the intensity of Lear's feelings. And as Susan Chitty wryly observes, it was only Fortescue's relations who complained of Lear's embarrassingly fervent devotion. But his ability to inspire and share laughter with an attractive companion was a healing factor that always helped to relieve the morbids. It was one reason why he so loved to be with Chook. He felt safe with Chook. He could delight in their company and their laughter. The shyness and fear of rejection he often suffered in the company of adults was completely absent when he was surrounded by happy, laughing Chook. Naturally, he expressed this in a liberty. There was an old Derry down Derry who loved to see little folks merry. So he made them a book, and with laughter they shook at the fun of that Derry down Derry. Lear's sublime paintings of the early 1860s reflect nothing of the political turmoil that marked the closing years of the British protectorate in Corfu. Only occasionally does he make joking references to it in his letters. At a time, for example, when the throne of Greece was again being offered to various princes and noblemen in Europe, Lear somberly announced that he would have to decline the throne if it were offered to him. He said much as he enjoyed the idea of becoming King Lear I, he thought he must resist the temptation on the grounds that he couldn't really trust the behavior of his daughters, Goneril and Regan. Like most homosexuals of his time, Lear felt unver under considerable social pressure to marry. And on several occasions, especially when feeling lonely or depressed, he did consider it though he doubted whether any woman would be able to tolerate his ugliness uh, in order to marry him. Nevertheless, he got on extremely well with women, delighted in their company when they demonstrated their liking for him, and came close to proposing to such very attractive women as Helena Cortazzi, 
in Corfu and Gussie Bethel in England. But as Vivian Noakes, his biographer, comments, the few amorous sentiments Lear expressed to unattached women faded when he was actually with them and when they were no longer safely unattainable. This too he caricatured, caricatured in the fruitless suit of the Yongi Bongi Bow. So, did Lear's quest for a lasting relationship of close intimacy never achieve fulfillment? Well, in a sense, it did. And it did in the shape of a loved and trusted servant, George Cockerley, whom he engaged in Corfu in 1856. He was only five years younger than Lear. And for the next 27 years, until his death in 1883, George Cockerley provided Lear with the loyal companionship, constant attention that he sorely needed, especially after the death of his beloved sister, Anne. Throughout all his travels, Lear had written with great regularity to Anne, bringing her up to date with the details of his activities in the manner of a journal. But he never wrote to his mother. With George, he continued to travel in warm climates, away from the damp, chill, and fogs of English winters. These made him very ill with his chest complaints. So trekking through magnificent scenery, far removed from the demands of conventional society, he found spiritual nourishment in his communion with Mother Nature. Mother Nature, the reliable, archetypal mother who could neither reject him nor abandon him. Nature, you see, never failed him. It was eternally comforting. Though he didn't settle permanently in Corfu, Lear returned again and again, visiting the island on nine separate occasions and spending a total of three years and four months of his life here. His love of Corfu was part of a more extended love of Greece as a whole, a love that had originally been inspired by the poetry of his boyhood hero, Lord Byron. Although he travelled through many lands, Lear loved Greece the most and always felt more at home in Greece and among Greeks than anywhere else. He was diligent about learning Greek and when in Corfu, a teacher came to give him a Greek lesson every morning for an hour before breakfast. As he wrote to his friend Emily Tennyson in 1856, Greek is the foundation of all knowledge and happiness. So to conclude, there can be little doubt that throughout his life he found his greatest sense of purpose and fulfillment in the practice of his art. As a result of the encouragement he received from Anne in childhood, Lear retained a passion from working directly from nature. His powers of detailed observation became apparent in the extraordinary drawings he made as a teenager of the parrots in Regent's Park Zoo. He went on to become very knowledgeable about botanical and zoological classifications. This, of course, he caricatured in case we thought he was being pompous. The nasty creature crawl up here. Many people here upside down here. Piggy Wiggia Pyramidalis. His powers of observation were brought to their highest expression in the topographical precision of the landscapes he made of Greece, revealing them to us now as they were then, before the tourists and the developers invaded them. What is more, he created these topographies with the vision of a poet. And it's a mark of his genius that he enables us to share in the aesthetic pleasure that he himself obviously experienced as he was working on them. As he told his patron, Lord Derby, nothing made him happier than being described 
as the painter of topographical poetry. So, through the works on display in this wonderful exhibition, we can delight in the untrammeled beauty of the Ionian world as, Law, as Lear saw it in his lifetime.